No, I hope you brought your books of Mormon because that's the handbook, that's everything. It's all in there, far more than you think. Far more than I ever guessed. As I'll show today, just right now, right at the beginning, something I've never seen there before, and it's extremely important. Well, we were talking when I rudely interrupted myself at the end of the, uh, the end of life. We were talking about jo uh, Joseph S. Smith, President Joseph S. Smith, and I was talking with him in his office, and we talked about crossing the Rubel Kali. Now, the Rubel Kali has the worst, that means the empty quarter, because it's empty. It's the worst desert in the world. There are parts of the Sierra, the worst parts of the Sierra have Tuaregs, and they have an occasional tree and uh, some water in them. And not long ago, they were quite wet. But not the empty quarter. There is nothing in it. And yet they crossed that. <laughs> and they had a journey of eight years in the desert. Now, do you mean they carried all those tents and stuff on their backs doing that? Oh, of course they didn't. I explained that to Brother Smith, and he immediately changed his mind. He says, I was wrong, completely wrong. Obviously, that's the only way they could do it. So don't get the idea that Joseph S. Smith was an old curmudgeon. He was not. He was very open-minded and very liberal. All you had to do was point out the situation. Everything is very clearly set forth in the Book of Mormon. I don't know. Oh, and here's another thing. I was saying, Yahudu Maudiyamai. There are over 20 definitions of the word Hadi Yahudu given in the Book of Mormon, and in the dictionary. Uh, this, you can put any vowels you want in it. If you call it Yuhawid, Yuhawidu, uh, that would mean that uh, he was, um, he was, in the water, he was uh, wading in the water. Hadiyahudu, but in the second form, Yuhawidu, it means to wade in and be overwhelmed. Now, the editor assumes that this represents the water, and he's floundering around in the water, and if you change, Yuhawidu, it has to change to Yuhidu. So Yahudu can mean to lead a horse to water. I mean, you would have an Arabic word with as many as a hundred different meanings. Can lead a horse to water, or to be tossed about by the water, or it means to struggle in water, to wade across water. Well, he's, if this is water, you see, he's in it up to the ears. And notice how his hoda is, is flying and he's wildly waving his stick and so forth. Is he getting through the stream of water? And of course, we think of the, the filthy water in the Book of Mormon. And there's some interesting comments on that, and we'll get to that. We may get to that, the filthy water, because that's worth mentioning here. I have some pictures and things. But let's consider now uh, just this, uh, the second chapter. Well, the first chapter, they're going down very rapidly. We're not going to linger in the desert now. Eight years is too long for the course. So we'll have to get through fast, and, uh, but some things to notice here, uh, that he, uh, notice, well, here we start right out here. And he takes all his stuff with him, and then they go down in the borders. You see, it mentions twice the borders, in the uh, fifth verse. Notice borders. Notice borders in the fifth verse. Have you got the fifth verse there? That should be capitalized because that's what that area has always been called, the Jabal, which means the borders. See, Joseph Smith didn't know that, and neither did Oliver Cowdery, so they left it uncapitalized. But the borders is what they always called the area down which they went. That was the Jabal, means the, the ranges, the mountains. That Jabal, of course, is a range of mountains that separates one country from another. This had that name, Jabal. And so they went down into the borders. And notice they found here a, after three days, in a valley beside a river of water. Why a river of water? Because usually it's a river of sand. Naharama, it's Rama River of Sand. But this is a, 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 a river of water. Well, how would they find a river of water in the desert at that time? Hey, we might as well unfold the map here. Hope I didn't forget everything. Now, here it is. This is one they can pick up on the machine, I think. Uh, here we are. It says down here, I guess I should thumbtack it on or something. Here is the trip they take, you see. The, uh, uh, somebody could hold this up, and I'll hold this side up. That's a good idea. Yeah. So here's the way they come. They leave Jerusalem, they go down. Here's your three days journey. The three days journey uh, camel you can make from, the normal is 30 miles a day, but you can make 30 to 60 miles a day, and in, under pressure you make 100 miles a day, and camels move right along would be down here, but you'll notice this is the, here, this is the, the Jauf, they call this the Jauf, and then this is called the Araba. This long depression, see these are rifts, 
the Nile Valley is a rift, and they were a complete mystery until Professor Wegener in the 1930s introduced the continental drift theory. Now realize that the, that the Earth's crust is moving, and these are these are breaks, and this long one goes down all down the Jordan Valley, it continues right on down here. You see this long rift here, and it's a deep depression all the way down here with high cliffs, just like Rock Canyon on either side. Down this side of the Dead Sea, it's, it's immense. We'll see that, I have some pictures of that later. But then they go on down here, and they continue here, and uh, these valleys and gullies that empty down here uh, in the river in the wintertime, once in a while they run with water, and uh, most of the time they're dry. But when you find a wadi that has water in it, that's a river of water, and that's considered something very unusual. And it tells us in the fourth verse at the beginning, at the commencement of the year. So this was the early, this was the winter time when they were running, when there was water running it. And it, uh, the sight of it set Lehi into fits of ecstasy, as we'll see, because that's what an Arab does whenever he sees water. So this is the way they come down. <laughs> it says down here, to my surprise, that it was prepared by me. No, it wasn't, because I would never call this Iriantum. This is Iriantum. There's, a, there's an Egyptian writing that tells us this is the fountain of the Red Sea, and even uses the word Iriantum. So you can get it out of there as far as that goes. So somebody put that down there and said I was responsible. But here's the way. <laughs> now, this, why do we know that they went this way, you see? They turned this way. This is the Rubel Kali, the empty quarter, see? And it is empty. I said, it wasn't crossed by anybody, supposedly, in 1930. Then there were two men claimed to, f to cross it. No, it's crossed. It's a milk run now. This is the world we live in, you see? But the, uh, Joseph Smith said it was on the 19th parallel they turned east by a little south. South by east, south by east. And this is the way they went. East and south, a little south, but they went east, and that would have them come out at the Kara Mountains, where they, which are rich in timber, uh, along which are very unexpected. They caught Captain, uh, not Chessman, but uh, uh, by, by complete surprise, uh, well, well, I remember this captain, is uh, uh, Philby was the one that claimed to cross it, and then uh, that was the father of the, of the defect, you know, that was somebody else, who wrote a great book on, on Arabia. But this is... Uh, uh, Captain Thomas, Bertram Thomas, he was the one that discovered these mountains. They weren't discovered until 1930s, imagine that. They didn't even know that there was such a nice fertile place there. So here's the way we go. Well, we'll refer to this later, and uh, you get the idea. They come down the coast there, and we can leave it. Too bad we don't have, you know, we don't have any, uh, could have put thumbtacks there. No, they wouldn't go into the middle. Let's just, there we go, we'll leave it there. It'll stay. Ah, oh, good because that's the part there. And we're not lingering on geography or things like that. It's points of doctrine we're interested in now. And this is a very important thing. And then, as we noticed, when they went, well, here, about, about the Casita. We have to mention that, though. Uh, came to pass, he called the name of the river Laman, and it emptied into the Red Sea. And the valley was in the borders thereof. There's the borders for the third time, you see. This area called the Jabal. It's a mountain range uh, in the borders thereof near the mouth thereof, in the valley. And so it emptied into the Red Sea. We know where they were. And he, he renamed them. That's what the Arabs do when they go down here. After, after all, if you're going in strange territory, you give names to things as you go. The pioneers did that. I mean, certain things like Chimney Rock have been named various things. Timpanocos has quite a number of names. They, they have renamed Mount McKinley now. It's back to, to <coughs> Danabi now, or uh, it, it's, it's received its old Indian name. Different people name them what they think they are. And he named it that, and then I say, he recites a Qasida. The oldest form of poetry in Arabic is, is a Qasida. Qasida means when you're wandering and looking for something and finally come to some beautiful aspect of nature, a valley or an oasis or something particularly lovely, then you say, Kifaya Habibi, top my two friends and let me, con let me tell you about this. And then he compares these beauties of nature to eternal goodness of God and to human characteristics and so forth and makes it a moral lesson for the beholder because it moves him very deeply. That's kasida, you see. Well, kasida means to make a journey looking for something. Well, you're always looking for something. You wouldn't make a journey, you see. But the point is, if you're Bedouin Arabs, you're not going anywhere at all. Yet you're constantly on a kasida, you see. The eternal quest, knowing you're not going to find anything, the place you're in is no more interesting than, than the place you're going to. So Lehi recites the Casita to his, to his two sons. You recite it to your two friends. Well, I've cited some examples of this in that book called Lehi in the Desert. We won't linger on it, but notice the ecstasies he goes into. 
When my father saw the waters of the river emptying into the fountain of the Red Sea, that expression, fountain of the Red Sea, is the one that's used. Remember, the ancients believed that the, the sea was the fresh fountain, and it fed all the rivers of the land. It was the other way around. And uh, this one um, up, up here is called the fountain of the Red Sea. Well, there's a writing called the Victory Over Seth that was read in all the temples of Egypt every day in which the expression occurs. We won't, I say, linger over these things. Then he spake unto Laman, his oldest son, saying, Oh, that thou mightest be like unto this river, continually running into the fountain of all righteousness. The sea was never stagnant for the ancients, not stagnant. Uh, it was, uh, if any water runs for, for the Arabs, runs for more than half an hour, you see, it's considered continual, it's considered practically perennial as far as they're concerned, but it's seasonal. In other words, it says this was at the beginning of the year, uh, the commencement of the year, it says, when the waters would be running. Then he sp speaks to his other son, Lemuel, uh, Lemuel, and he says, Oh, that thou might, who has a good, pure Arabic name, incidentally, Oh, that thou mightest be like unto this valley, firm and steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Again, why would a valley be firm and steadfast? We say mountains are firm and steadfast. Well, for the Arab, where do you find life? Where do you find security? Uh, where do you find safety? Well, it's in the valleys where there's the water, where there's the vegetation. Anywhere else, you're, you're a dead man. Nobody wants to go on a mountain there. Uh, you wouldn't want to go up on, on Cascade Mountain here. If you wanted to survive, you'd stay down in the canyon. Well, anyway... But Laman and Lemuel didn't want it. They were against their father, we mentioned as being a pikeach, a visionary man. They didn't want to leave the land of Jerusalem and their inheritance, the land of their inheritance. That's very interesting. Notice it says, to lead them out of the land of Jerusalem, to leave the land of their inheritance. The la we'll come to inheritance presently. Their gold, silver, and their precious, to perish in the wilderness. This they said because of his foolish imaginings of his heart. Laman and Lemuel began to murmur. They knew not the dealings of God who had created them. Neither did they believe that Jerusalem, that great city, from the first see they were disillusioned, could be taken. Well, now, Jerusalem had already been taken completely. It could be, notice it didn't, didn't taken, could be destroyed. It had been taken in 950, and it had been taken in 720, and in 605, and in 597, been spared every time. Sometimes taken by the Babylonians, sometimes by the Assyrians, sometimes by the Egyptians. But nobody wanted to ruin Jerusalem. They wanted to take it so they could have it as a base and so forth. And it wasn't until this final... Remember, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had been very forbearing. He had spared them. He'd spared the people. He'd been kind to Necho and put, sent him back to Egypt uh, to be Pharaoh there, serve his interests, and then Necho turned against him. Then he got very angry. And the same thing with Josiah. He was, he was willing to cooperate with the Jews, but when they, when they played footsie with the Egyptians... Then, when he took it in 597, he spared the city and went back. But when he came back, he was good and mad this time, and he destroyed it completely. But they say that the city couldn't be destroyed, because nobody has ever destroyed it. We don't destroy Jerusalem. So they didn't say it couldn't be taken, but it couldn't be destroyed. They felt secure all the time. They had the wealth and all this sort of thing. And they had all these things in common. As we said, it was a world civilization. They shared these things. So they, they didn't believe that. But now we come to a surprising thing. I say a thing after all these years I've never noticed myself. This, you've got to bring the Book of Mormon. Anyone who doesn't bring the Book of Mormon doesn't get a gold star the next time. So this is bad, you see. And could be taken. And it came to pass that my father did speak to them. He did confound them. And they, they couldn't complain anymore, but they still didn't change their mind. Nephi was exceeding young. Now listen to his condition there. Being large in stature, having great desire to know the mysteries of God, I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me and soften my heart that I believed all the words which had been spoken by my father. But he had to have a special revelation himself. He didn't like the idea at all. And then he had to work hard on his brother Sam to convince him over it. Nobody wanted the idea of leaving Jerusalem. Nephi liked it just as little as the others. And he prayed, he cried unto the Lord, and he visited me and softened my heart so that I would go along with my father. But he wasn't gung-ho to go out on there and have some fun out in the desert. <laughs> Not a bit of it. He didn't want it, and then his friend, his brother Sam, didn't want it. Then he talked to Sam, making known unto him the things which the Lord had manifest to me by his Holy Spirit. He conveys his special revelation to Sam here, and Sam, he believed my words, finally, you see, and it came to pass that he believed my words, and he had to be convinced too. So it had to be, everybody had to be sold on this trip in the first place, including Nephi and Sam themselves. So I uh, that I hadn't noticed, but it's plain nobody wanted to go out into that desert. <laughs> it would be something. And then we come to the theme of the Book of Mormon, verse 20 to 24. You say, why do we linger so much about on this part? We're not going very fast. Well, we mustn't go fast because it's here. And because 
right here we have the whole Book of Mormon. This theme is going to be repeated throughout in, in different ways and with different things. It's a sad story, a story from the dust, as we'll see presently, and uh, it's for us. Alas, alas. I wish it wasn't. But this is it. Inasmuch as ye shall keep, this is the promised land, ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper, and ye shall be led to a land of promise. Yea, a land which I have prepared for you, which is choice above all other lands. Well, we go on that. But remember, the migrations at this time, they were all looking for promised lands. Tertius was looking for a promised land. He tells his people about it. Hesiod, the great Greek poet, contemporary of Homer, was looking for a, for a promised land and tells how they looked and found nothing but bad places wherever they went. They just had to keep on the move. Everybody, and of course, the beginning of the Iliad, uh, Virgil, Duretavos met Rebus Tecundis, and so forth. Tendimus per varius casos, per tot discriminarium, tendum in latio, so many, through many disasters and, and trials, per tot discriminarium, through many close calls, tendimus in latio. We're, we're making our way toward Latium, where there awaits us a seat in a promised land. See, so they were getting from Troy clear over to Italy to find a promised land. So at the time of Lehi, everybody was looking for promised lands, as they had been before. Not everybody, but most people were. And because everybody, remember, everything, everybody was shaken up, uh, world revolution, this sort of thing. So this was it. They'd find their promised land. But if thy brethren rebel against me, he's talking about layman and women or anybody else, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. Inasmuch as thou shalt keep my commandments, thou shalt be made a ruler and a teacher over thy brethren. For behold, in that day that they shall rebel against me, I will curse them even with a sore cursing, and they shall have no power over thy seed. The Lamanites are never the problem in the Book of Mormon, never. And so shall no, no power over thy seed, except they shall rebel against me also. And when that happens, I want the Lamanites to be there in place to jump all over you. And if it so be that they rebel against me, they shall be a scourge to thy seed to stir them up in the ways of remembrance. I want them breathing down your neck all the time. You will not solve your problem by getting rid of the Lamanites, which they tried to do and failed, and it was their own undoing, as we know. So who is the enemy? There is no comfort uh, or battle, uh, there is no conflict, co conflict over there, or battle in the Book of Mormon between the, the righteous and the wicked. We'll, we'll see that. It's always when people are equally right, uh, wicked that they collide. And then the... Uh, so this is the promise, and this is the theme of the Book of Mormon. Then we come to the third chapter. This is a, a fast one. Speaking with the Lord, notice, to the tent of my father. He returns to the tent there, li living in the Beit And uh, then he says, behold, his father says, I have dreamed a dream. Notice this. I have dreamed a dream. Well, this is where he says another thing. I, Nephi, from speaking with my father. And it came to pass, he spake unto me, saying, I have dreamed a dream. And then they have to go back to Laban and fetch the place. Well, we talked about Laban and the character of Jaush in the, in the Lakish letters. He was the military governor. He kept the records. We're going to have a new case turn up again today where the very same thing happens again uh, years later, where the records are kept in the, in the guardhouse. And then... Uh, well, when they go back to get the records, we've seen that. Let's, let's rush along with chapter two, uh, three here. What do we do? Uh, let's go back here and uh, turn to a source even more important than the Lakish letters that tells an awful lot of things. Uh, oh, this third chapter is vitally important. They're going to have to flee, and it must needs be that he flee out of the land. He must flee out of the land. Sometimes you can't stay. They have to, he says, I don't have the vaguest idea why we have to obtain the records, Lehi says except it may be to preserve the language of our fathers. It turned out that wasn't the main reason. So under the words of the holy prophets, since the world began, uh, quite a record, uh, who were the holy prophets before them. And uh, as I say, I want to get off the first chapter, so we're going to move right on. So I'm going to go right over to the Mark Cookbird letters and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are enormously important by the Book of Mormon. No, notice this here in the fourth chapter. Let us go again to Jerusalem. Then he says, For behold, he is mightier than all the earth. Why not mightier than Laban and his fifty, yea, or even than his tens of thousands, his garrison of fifty, his troops of ten thousand. Notice the, 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 regular, the, the regular division in, a, in the army is ten thousand there, as it is uh, at the Hill Cumorah and as it is in the, the battle scroll, too. So, uh, if one wants to 
linger on all these things, but I want to talk about, because we don't know anything about it, about the, uh, these scrolls. Remember, he builds the altar, we have the altar here, and uh, so on the Big Mud, <coughs> you see the cliffs and the caves along there. These cliffs are also full of caves now. But this is the uh, Bar Kokhba. Now, this was in 1961. These are other scrolls from further down along the, the uh, I'll give you a map here. Oh, we can leave this one. We have some good maps here. But here along, as you go along this, uh, along this rift, the cliffs are very high, as I told you. And here is where they find these scrolls. This is, this is a bunch of these in these caves along here. It's a very perilous situation. Also, some good pictures here to show what the situation is. We can wave it around. Uh, see, you come down over oh, the maps there. It's a small one. It's this sort of thing. Want to get the big maps. Now, here's a, the valley where they found it. This is the, the Nahal Haver. It's the sort of stuff you find down in southern Utah, as you know, very <coughs> very precipitous, very steep, and very dangerous, where they found these particular ones here, the caves across the way. Now, this is across the valley. On the other side, this is the Roman camp. And the Romans were camped here, and they could watch and see everything that was going on over there. So the people had to sneak out by night to get groceries and so forth. As a matter of fact, they were never able to escape, and they perished in these caves. Now, there are many of them. This is, these are the caves of documents. They were rich in documents, which is a very important thing. And uh, well, well, here, here for example, you see how, how very, if you can see how very precipitous that is. As I say, uh, I wish they books hadn't been stolen, but. Uh, here are caves, and when the Jews were tipped off to this, the Israelis were tipped off, and they went up to start look for them, the place was crawling with Arabs, little Arab boys crawling all over the place because they knew they could get one pound for a square centimeter of, of a scroll if it had writing on it. And they got in there and they would collect them, and the best way they found, why fight it? Uh, if they're willing to risk their necks, let them bring in the scrolls, and they, so they would provide them with uh, cigar boxes with with cotton in them and say, now put them in here and then we'll pay you for them. And the bigger the piece, the more you'll get paid for it. So they got diligent uh, looking for these and they knew all about these caves. Uh, but fortunately, the people who were in the caves and hid there didn't just drop the materials and leave them, they buried them. They buried them on purpose in the earth so that they were still there. And we got these priceless documents from these caves along the Dead Sea. This wasn't in 47 where they got the other ones, but this was in 50, uh, in 61. Climbing up to the caves, I'm sorry you can't see it from there, but uh, here they are from the inside of the caves. I say there were many caves. Here's a map showing where they are. It's a good big map, so you can see it even from there. More precipitous here, for example. This is the cave of letters. You see, it's a big cave. It goes in. Here's where they found, for example, uh, metal vessels, marvelous metal vessels, I mean, the, uh, well, I'll show you some of them anyway, just pointing out first. Here they found a cache of letters. Here they found a doctrine of uh, the Psalms. Have a so they had the scriptures with them, you see. And here they found a bunch of keys to houses in Jerusalem and in Gedi. People brought their keys with them. They want to go home again. They locked up when they left, you see. They found a batch of keys. And here they found the Babata archives, a, a, a very rich woman had always been in legation, and she made herself a lot of money in real estate, and she kept all her documents, and they're there. And then we find out about lands of the inheritance, and this sort of thing that they talk about. Remember the boys, when they wanted to get their treasure, and it was exceedingly great, it says, and brought it back and showed it to Laban to bribe him for the plates, and that's all they did, of course, was grab the money and uh, keep the plates, too. But uh, the the, uh, we know what these lands of inheritance were. They say they went down. It wasn't in Jerusalem. It says that we'll go down to the lands of our inheritance, and then we'll fetch back all these gold and silver and precious things, and we know where the lands of inheritance were. Because when, this should be a, a Dead Sea map. I can draw better than that. Uh, because they, they all fled south and east. All the rich people, all the middle class, fled south and east. The poor people stayed behind. They couldn't afford to go. And you see Nebuchadnezzar spared them, so from reorganized them under Jeremiah and people like that. And, uh, but the rich people did exactly what the Lehi's people were doing. They skipped off in this direction. Well, in this one, so we have the archive of this uh, widow, uh, Babata, and she's some dame. And then we have this marvelous glasswork here. And here's a net with all sorts of of sewing, as uh, some people brought their knitting and uh, to keep their clothes going, to repair clothes and so forth. And here is the 
a lot of skulls in a basket, lots of baskets and things. And here at the very back of the cave are the letters of Bar Kokhba himself. It was Bar Kokhba, see, Jerusalem, as the Book of Mormon tells us, has been destroyed from time to time. And this was a time, the, the letters further up north go from the time it fell in the year 70 to the Emperor Titus. These, when it fell again, Hadrian's time, in 132, finally, and Bar Kokhba had made himself president of Israel and organized an army, and he fought back. And these are the documents that have to do with that and tell us a lot about this. So this was later, and it had gone on before. But the surprising thing is people had been going to these caves and doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Here, for example, we have, you can find them here, here. These things, these bronze mace heads, these strange temple vessels, beautifully made bronze things, they are f over 5,000 years old. 3,000 years before, before, well, 2,500 years before Lehi, but 3,000 years before these people went, the Jews were still hiding. And this time they were hiding from a pharaoh of the first dynasty of Egypt who came up and chased them out of Jerusalem. Way back there, imagine that. Uh, of course, they weren't Jews at this time. Uh, there was somebody else, but people, this was the thing, that's what these caves are for. When you get invaded, you go hide in the cave. So these things had been hidden 3,000 years before Bar Kokhba. It's amazing. Extremely curious, he says, among the 240 different shaped objects of copper and so forth, about 20 chisels, axes of various shapes and sizes, 82 black objects bearing this, and here's a, a sort of crown. Now this is 3,000 years before Bar Kokhba went there uh, in 132 AD. So these caves were, this was uh, the milk run, so to speak. Anytime somebody rang the bell, everybody took off to the caves. And this is a practice in some parts of the world, too. <laughs> well, after all, if you've been in London during the Blitz, you know, as soon as you heard the siren, you ran down to the subway. Of course, you didn't, but you should. And uh, so we have the same sort of thing going on here. But it's what's in the documents, of course, that interest us here. Yes? Yes, they hid. Hid in that cave. When because remember, these caves are not on, this is a long way from Jerusalem. This is, uh, uh, these caves here, well, the, show you the map here. This doesn't show anything. But uh, this is the way we go here. Uh, here's the Dead Sea. Here's the Lisan. It comes up like this. And here's the Jordan. Here is Qumran here. You go 20 miles be beyond Qumran and you get to Ain Dedi. That's where a lot of these people had their farms and so forth. This was the very popular place for the rich and so forth, and they had their farms, and, but their lands of inheritance were somewhere d down here in Azar. And then down, oh, below En Gedi, well, yes, you go down here, uh, no, uh, below En Gedi, which is here, 30 miles below that, and then this is the road that takes you up, is, uh, is the Nahal Caver, uh, they call it that now, the Brook Caver, uh, the Arabs call it the Nahal, what do they, they give it a special name, oh, we have the map here. Anyway, uh, these, these canyons going all along here, you know, Qumran itself, very impressive, looks just like the side of Rock Canyon, right from, right from Qumran, right along here, because this is, the, this is the lowest spot on Earth, remember that, this is the lowest spot on Earth, so it's way down there, and these are very impressive cliffs, and this is where these people were hiding out, in these side cliffs here, the Nahal Cave is this, this low, and just below Engedi, where they go out and bathe today, and they have the, the oil seeps up and makes this tar, and people rub it on, they say it cures them of rheumatism. You see these fat ladies from Jerusalem completely covered with this black tar, uh, basking in the warm waters of the Dead Sea, which are all somewhat salt, you know. But it's an interesting situation here, and uh, let's see some more things here that, uh, that might, as long as we're on the, the book, intrigue us. Now look here, here's a basket, looks like the kind you buy in Mexico, in perfect condition. There's one break in it, and it was full of household goods that they, we talked about the bronze vessels, beautifully made vessels. Here, you know, see, here's your baskets full of, basket full of household wear and valuable dishes and things like that, which were, I say, very well made. You notice these things they are. These are ritual dishes. These are, notice, the ash pans for the temple, for the, for the sacrifice of the temple, for the burning of incense in the temple. And so they bring their, their temple, their sacred vessels and their household effects, but also they, they bring their their business records, and that's the important thing about it, because we know there's a marvelous section here on, on the business records. See these vessels? Yeah. Nice things. Uh, in these uh, caves, the... Whew. 
fancy stuff. Then, of course, the most important, I say, are the, are the written records. Um, there's a mirror. See, there's a woman's mirror. They have quite a lot of cosmetics and stuff. That basket had cosmetics. Now, here's a bundle of papyri, very carefully folded, all very neatly labeled with wooden labels, so they're properly filed and fed into the computer. And that's Professor Yadin himself. He's visited Prova a number of times. We've had some wonderful talks with him. He's told us some marvelous stories here down at uh, Kent Brown's house and so forth. We get together. And he's a marvelous man. He's, he's dead now. He just died a couple of years ago. And he's the head of the Israel Antiquities and also was the leader of the army in the 48 war. And he tells some very exciting stories about that. When they, that totally unexpected victory. And it's an interesting thing. The very week the war broke out, they discovered the battle scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which described how ancient Israel went to war, had to be clothed with righteousness, and it was that which fired them more than anything else, he said, to go ahead and win a war that the odds were 50 to 1 against them. They wanted it. I say I could, we could a tale unfold where that concerned. But anyway, here we get to the documents. One document is particularly interesting. Here they are digging in the cave. Oh, here are instruments. See here, are a pair of sandals and household knives, uh, things like that. Another basket in very good condition. Uh, because I say this is, oops, we'll pick that up there. There's the item at work. And some of the more striking, here's a, a bundle of documents here. The big archive papyri is found. Notice the meticulous wrapping and packing. This is the archive of papyri. Another one, and very carefully wrapped up. See, these people keep their records. Notice how record conscious these people are when they flee. The one thing Lehi wants to get, because the Lord told him to get it, they have to go back and get those family records. They have to get their genealogy set, and they have to get the books of Moses. They have to get the bronze plates. Here they are working in the caves. I wasn't in these caves, but I certainly climbed all over Qumran. Uh, and here is a prize, as far as I'm concerned. As you go in the scrollery at Jerusalem, you turn... It's called the turn to the left, and the first document to see is this document, which has a light behind it. It's a contract to the ownership of the farm down there. And one of the owners of the farm was this man here, Alma ben Yehuda, Alma son of Judah, which uh, Professor Yadin renders Alma, A-L-M-A, -A, without any apology, son of Judah. Now, people have laughed for years about that name Alma, because Alma is a Latin word for, as a woman's name. It means soul, Alma matter, and that sort of thing. And uh, they tried to figure out some Hebrew name like it, Alma, which means a coat of mail, one word meaning a young man. But this is just A-L-M-A, -A, like that, and so yet yeah, properly makes it Alma. And the son of Judah, you know he was a man, and you know he was a Jew, if he's Alma, son of Judah. But I'll write his name on the board. Some of you may have seen it before. That's the name. <laughs> so it's very striking to walk there into the scroll and the first name that hits you in the face is Alma, the son of Judah. So there was an Alma after all. It's a perfectly good Jewish name. But if people run out of town, how can they expect people to know about them? Uh, and so I say we have here a most remarkable find and let us consider now, oh here's some, yes? Here's some of the keys. Here's some of the door keys, you see there. I, see, I don't think they're too subtle, but they worked. <laughs> the wooden handles and so forth, yes. Where is this on? It's on a scroll. It's in the scroll in Jerusalem now. The scroll, that's that dome, you know, that spreads out like that, and you go in, it has the scrolls all around. When you go in the first scroll, you see the one on the left has a light behind it shining through. It's very pretty written. And there's, there's where you see Alma. So I say it, it meets you first. Well, we've got to get on with this now to the serious stuff. And, uh, and then this is very important. The Lord prophesied this very, these very destructions, the, one, the 70 and the 130, 130 to 132. He prophesied those in the 24th chapter of Matthew, and Joseph Smith has chosen that particular chapter to give us a correct version, which it is a correct version. He puts everything in right and put it in the pearl of great price as the second part of Joseph Smith. Just to point out what the situation is, the way the way uh, the Lord makes it clear to the apostles what's going to happen to Jerusalem when it's destroyed. When, therefore, you see the abomination, this is Alma, not Alma, this is Matthew uh, 24, and it's the 15th verse of the King James, it's the 12th verse of the Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith rearranges the verses. They don't make sense uh, the way they stand now. As a matter of fact, they are never used as sermons in Christian churches. There, there's a rule, avoid this, because there's a good deal of confusion here. The... Uh, 
The verses have been rearranged to suit a particular prejudice, the prejudice being namely that the Lord would only come once, that he wouldn't come again. He couldn't, you couldn't have more than one destruction. Of course, that's the, the point of the whole thing. He deals of one thing happening after another. He talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, then the restoration, then the restoration of the gospel, and then the destruction in the last days. And he ends on the final note, uh, as uh, in our Joseph Smith version, thus cometh the end of the wicked according to the prophecy of Moses, saying, They shall be cut off from among the people. But the end of the earth is not yet, but by and by. That's not the destruction of the earth at all. That's not yet. It's the end of the world. He says, this is the end of the world. He repeats it three times. Or the destruction of the wicked. But this is not the end of the earth. That's by and by. You don't talk about that. We don't know when that will be. That's another story. But here he describes exactly what's happening here. When he says, and nobody noticed it either. At this time, it'll be a destruction. Them who, let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's what they always done. They go, go to these valleys, these steep wadis, the mountains and the caves, which are right next to Jerusalem. I say these caves, there are thousands of them. They get, well, they've discovered Dead Sea Scrolls, over 500, between 518 uh, documents from the Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered in, in over 100 caves. You see, so the caves are all over the place, way down here. We're far above. This has nothing to do with the uh, Qumran caves. See, but there's still Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, so they flee to the mountains. That's what you do. But let him who is on the housetop flee and not return to take anything out of the house. These people return to take things out of the house. One person, I told her I returned too late, and she lost her life. Now this Babata, she was rich and thought she could get her way out, but she lost her life. She, she couldn't get away with it. And so it's a very serious case. Don't go back to Jerusalem for anything this time. This is the big time, he says. Neither let him who was in the field turn back to take his clothes. And then he says, if you have... New babies, get out of town ahead of time. Notice this is warning ahead of time. It's not just telling them how terrible it's going to be when he says, pray that the Lord your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath. You must arrange your things so that you can get out ahead of that. And if you have any women that are pregnant, he says, don't stay in town, get out of town in good time and pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. Uh, you, uh, you want to arrange it. For in those days shall be a tribulation on the Jews upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, which has not been sent upon Israel of God since the beginning of their kingdom until this time, nor shall ever again be sent against Israel. What happened with these fault? That's when the Jews were driven out for the last time. I say, the town had been taken again and again. As the Book of Mormon says, it had been destroyed and people have returned. This time, he says, they're not coming back, not for 2,000 years. This is going to be by far the worst of all, and it was. The Jews never came back. Remember, they became non-persons. They had known no identity whatever. <laughs> then came the great persecution of 2,000 years. You had, as late as the 1850s, uh, the, the uh, Macaulay in his famous essay on the physical, on the, on the political disabilities of the Jews. As late as the 1850s. The Jews were not allowed to vote or hold property, anything like that in, in most countries and in England too. That's what Macaulay is protesting about. If the Duke wanted to take over everything you had, they, they were their advisors and assistants all over because they were brilliant men. But any time they could be executed or the, anything confiscated, they have no rights whatever, as you read in, in Shakespeare and elsewhere. And so this is the worst they'll ever have. All the things which has fallen them up to now are only a beginning of the sorrows that shall come upon them for this 2,000 year vacation. But then they went back after you. See. Remember, until very recently, as long as, as in the 1840s and 1850s, the Christian church absolutely insisted, all the Christians, that the Jews would never return to Jerusalem because the veil of the temple was went, and the Lord said the temple was destroyed, and the Jews would never go back to Jerusalem, having that all the time, up to 1948, the, when Harry Truman sent the amb ambassador. Uh, he visited the Pope on the way, and the Pope said, absolutely nothing doing. The Jews must never go back to Jerusalem. It would frustrate all prophecy. They thought he would never go back, and so forth. Well, I have an article on that in the Encyclopedia Judaica. I had to look up a lot of this stuff, and, and believe me, the Christian world was the only people that ever believed the Jews would go back to Jerusalem, of course, is the Mormons. We always preach that, of course. They would go back to Jerusalem, just as we would have Zion over here. And except in those days, should be shortened, there should none of their flesh perish. And of course, they would have been wiped out completely time and again. But for the elect's sake, according to the covenant, those days shall be shortened. So this is the sort of thing that happened. They should not go back, and they should flee to the mountains. That's what they always did before. And be careful that you don't have to uh, flee when you're uh, in the wintertime, or when you, would, when you have expecting children, or when you're uh, on the Sabbath, which you can't move on. 
And this was the one that the Lord prophesied. And here we have it actually having, you have these documents, hundreds of documents, recording that particular event, that double event, you call it, the one in 70 and one in, in 130. So then, uh, the rich and middle class hurry south and east to the lands of their inheritance. This is what happens here. And uh, Babata had a friend whose name was, well, put her name on, Babata, because we have uh, all her possessions and so forth. She was a rich... Uh, Babata, and very unpleasant sort of woman. She had all this property. She married various husbands to get the property. And uh, her, own, her first property she inherited from her father. That became the land of her inheritance. And it was a rich farm in dates and so forth. They say it had a, uh, it had a good address. These people were very conscious of the lands of their inheritance down here. Uh, look up some examples here uh, from 247 on in the book. We're going to put something on reserve anyway here. Well, if you have a chance to look at it. This long section goes on. All of these documents, see the, the whole stash of her documents and her legal affairs and the like, and uh, what she was up to. The largest cache of documents in the Cave of Letters was the archive of Babata, the, doctor, the daughter of Shimeon, son of Menachem. Thanks to this woman, who managed to survive two husbands, must have spent lo most of her life in litigation, either suing the guardians of her fatherless son or being sued by various members of her deceased husband family. We have come by priceless source of the, the records of legal, historical data, and so forth. Uh, the, uh, she had a, a shrewd lawyer. Well, no, her father had a shrewd lawyer, which enabled him to get away with anything. And the... Uh, she married the family of Huthisian, uh, who formerly, which formerly came from Engedi, and she married Yehuda Huthisian. And notice, they don't, they don't hesitate to mix Greek and Nabataean and Hebrew and Arabic names. They're all mixed up all the time, just as they are in the Book of Mormon. Yehuda Huthisian, and he settled. He had a residence in Mahosa, and that became where he settled. That became his inheritance through her. You see. Uh, the, toward the end of the first century, a couple of decades after the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus, Babata's father, Shimeon, he was originally from Jerusalem, but he went down and settled in Mahosa, way down at the southern tip of the Dead Sea, which was in Nabataean country. He was under the king of the Nabataeans, but that was a very rich land, and he, he settled there and had a farm. And then uh, Babata inherited from him, and then she married a couple of guys and claimed their property too. And... Uh, very important fights about water rights. And uh, the document is extremely rich in legal terms, identical with those found in 5th century BC Aramaic documents from Egypt, as well as Jewish medieval legal. See from the time of Lehi, the same, same documents in Aramaic and in Egyptian. Uh, the deed must have been drafted by a clever lawyer. Shimeon managed by this document to get away with just about everything. The lawyer had it fixed. Remember, you get a lot of crooked lawyers in the Book of Mormon, too, you know that. And so, well, but she has a friend. Now, this friend is the Roman lady, Julia Crispin. Oh, here's an interesting remark that casts light on the situation of going down to the land of their inheritance and so forth. Uh, this illustrates some of the traits of assimilation among the wealthy Jewish families of the time. Not only in the fact that it was drawn up in Greek, but it was also one of the documents, among all these Hebrew documents, there's a Greek one. But specifically, it says that it's written according to Hellenic law. In this document, Yehuda, the son of Eliezer, Elias Cahusen, gave to marriage his own daughter, etc., etc. So the point is they're, they're t doing all the legal tricks and so forth, but notice the assimilation of the wealthy Jewish families intermarry with each other. Remember, they found out that Laban was related to Lehi when he started looking at the records they brought back, the genealogy, sure, he was related to Laban. All the, they're these upper-class upper people. Uh, now here, notice this. The list of palm groves is not the same as the ones she declared in the census, which her father, uh, which were, her fa were hers through her father. And the document states quite plainly the basis of Babata's ownership of her husband's grove which you hold, says the buyer of the crops, as you say do in lieu of your bride money and do. Now the purpose of the IOU, which you mentioned, comes clear. From now on, Babata was burdened with an additional property, begins a long engagement and litigation with certain members of her deceased husband's family. They fight for the property now. So this goes on. We have these sordid stories. Uh, this document explains, however, how Babata eventually, now the family headquarters, where she came from now, they were living now, not in Jerusalem, but in Ein Gedi here. I mentioned Ein Gedi, which is a very important settlement, right near the, these two great 
gorge is open in, and the one to the south is uh, is the Nahal the, Haver, uh, the Hebrew gully. The, uh, <coughs> the palm grows way down at Petra. Yes, she eventually found her way to Engedi, not solely because her property there, because her own numerous relatives in that place, because her, hus her second husband's other wife, Miriam, the daughter of Benyan, she found herself remotely connected to the commander-in-chief of Engedi in Bar Kokhba's administration. So there you're going to get the, the military in the picture and so forth. I don't have any more time here, but it's an amazing thing. Uh, oh, this woman, Julia Crispe, she's her friend. 132, the next year, 133, Julia Crispina turns up in Egypt, where she owns a rich farm in the Delta. So you see how these people had their investments everywhere. Uh, Julia Crispina, a friend of Babata. Babata never escaped. She died in the caves there. She couldn't get out. The Romans had them trapped. And so they, uh, but her friend, Julia Crispina, carried on, and we find her happily ensconced on her farm in Egypt a little later. See, they're always try all trying to get out to Egypt. This was the idea. So the picture is, is rather a, a vivid one here. And then, um, as to, oh, one picture I want to show you here is an interesting one. Remember we're told Lehi saw a dream and then Nephi saw the dream. The water his father saw was filthy water and it swept the, swept the wicked away to destruction when it came. That was what the Arabs call a sile. Remember, those gullies that go down, when it rains, in mountains high behind, which are quite high, in the mountains behind, you'll have cloud bursts, and all of a sudden a wall of water will come down the valley, that's Masada there, you see, come down the valley and sweep everything away. And for years they'll be dry, and so that's where most of the water and the, and the shrubbery is, so the, the Bedouins will come along and camp in the, at the mouth of the Siles. And there's a lot said about in the poems and so forth, about what happens when you're suddenly caught in this stream of filthy water and swept away. I cited some more passages on that in that book called Lehi in the Desert. But we have one here, and let me see now. Wait, I've got the sile right here. Uh, yes, 214 here. Aha. Uh -huh. Here, you, you can't see it from there, but uh, somebody can. Oh, here they are in the cave among all the dust and so forth. This is the cave of letters. See, it's a big place. And uh, they were going to hide out indefinitely there. But everything is out of the dust, and, and we'll mention that. But here, he says, watching a rare waterfall in the Nahal Haver, west of the Cave of Letters, the water's falling, quite a waterfall, but it isn't a white waterfall, it's a mud, it's, it's filthy water. It's, but when it comes down, of course, I've seen it around St. George and places like that, you'll see these, uh, these gully washers come out, very dangerous. Well, you mustn't ever hike up the Zion Narrows, you know. If you do, you and get caught up there. A group from my ward, uh, five Boy Scouts were drowned up there when, my, when I was in the old mountain ward. They got caught in the narrows when that water comes down. The, the, mountain, the, the, the rainstorm is way up there by Lower and Bickle. You never expect it, and down <laughs> she comes. And, but this water, you know, it's a, it's a good, lively waterfall, but it's filthy. It's a, it's a, uh, a stream of filthy water. It's a sound, and that's exactly the, the nightmare that Nephi has. His father saw his brethren, and the, the wicked were camped there, and the a stream of filthy water came along and swept them all away to the structure. It sweeps them out to the sea. See, this, is, this is what happens. Remember, this river opens to the sea. So there's another one of these, these cultural notes and so forth. Uh, and the, uh, I notice this is, this is uh, First Nephi in 1527, so you have to get way ahead of it. We have to jump around so here. Yes, and, and I, said unto them that the water which my father saw was filthiness, and so much was his mind allowed, swallowed up in other things that he beheld not the filthiness of the water. And I said unto him that it was an awful gulf which separated the wicked from the tree of life. Remember that enormous gulf which you walk along in the desert and you come to one of those huge gulfs. You see, you get them in, in canyon lands and so forth. I spent a lot of time down there. And uh, you notice that Roman camp? And then there was a 2,000 foot drop between it and the caves on the other side. They were right together. But you couldn't get from the one to the other. And that's exactly what happens to the wicked. There's an awful gulf between them, and down that gulf sweeps this filthy water and sweeps them away, he said. That awful gulf which separated the wicked from the tree of life on the other side, and also the saints of God. I said to them, it was a representation of that awful hell which the angel said unto me was prepared for the wicked. The justice of God divides them. So he compares it to see this very thing. What meaneth, he said unto me, that river of water which our father saw? I said, well, the water was filthy water, and... Uh, it was on the other side, it was ran down the, gu the gully and swept away the wicked. Well now, there's, uh, 
another scroll we, that's very important here, and uh, <laughs> the only picture I have of the copper scrolls. Now, these copper scrolls found in Cave 3 are very important in uh, 1949. The copper scrolls, uh, Allegro, John Allegro wrote a book on them called The Treasure of the Copper Scrolls, which we'll talk about them. And their particular value is, uh, well, there's a recent article about them here by Norman Gold from 1987. But they were not on rolls, they weren't on rolled copper or anything like that. They were on sheets, regular size sheets like this. And then there were holes along here, but they riveted them together and then so they could roll them up. And the reason they put it on copper so they couldn't perish, because they were, as he tells us, gold tells because they were extra valuable. They, they had to be preserved, so they put them on bronze or copper. It's almost pure copper, it's a slight alloy. And uh, it was so, of course, it was so oxidized it took them, well, they weren't able to unroll it, they had to split it uh, at Manchester. They had to, with a fine diamond, so they had to split it down so that now they can lay it out in sections and read it. It tells where all the other stuff is buried, where all these other treasures, and where the written documents are buried. This is it. This is why it's so valuable. So when it became extremely important to keep a record, they kept it on, on bronze, on, you'd say, the brass plates. Remember, brass is a new word. It's only used in English uh, since the end of the 19th century. It's the bronze is the French word. We always said brass. The old English is brass. You won't find the word bronze in the Bible at all, though it's a... The Bible is a Bronze Age document, the Old Testament, because we call, always called it brass. The same word, you just drop the N out as well. The French called it bronze. We've taken bronze. So when he says brass plates, it's perfectly safe to think of those as bronze plates, because that's what they are. They're not made of glass, which is a mixture of, you know, as copper and nickel, whereas bronze is copper and tin, and, uh, and much more common, much more easy to make, and so on. They were, but I say throughout the Old Testament, uh, the word bronze never occurs because it's always brass. That's what you mean when you mean a, a copper alloy is always brass in English. And that was 17th century English anyway. <laughs> so it makes no difference. But the, the main thing is that it's copper base, isn't it? But this copper scroll is that, and it tells about uh, where the most valuable treasures are buried, and they're hidden all over the place, and where the records are to be found, and uh, will we ever be able to run them down? This is a very interesting, you see, confirmation of the idea of, uh, of bronze scrolls and the constant concern with burying and keeping records, which is an obsession in the Book of Mormon, as you know, along with the gold plates. So then we get to the, uh, oh dear, uh, the most important thing. What, what this is all about, you see, all this cultural note and stuff is just to back up other things. Uh, when you say we came down and reached the Kara Mountains, I say Captain Bertram Thomas discovered them in 1930. And uh, here's a picture of them. It's a very lush, beautiful mountains which are not expected. It says right on the edge of the Rubal Kali, the most absolute desert in the world, and they come as a total and complete surprise, and there they were. Well, but what interests us most here, of course, is the, the doctrine we're talking about, because what do the scrolls tell us and so forth? And this is extremely important. I see this article about in May and June of the in the sciences by Norman Gold at Chicago. And up until now, see, they found these scrolls, and they didn't like I'll have to get that article from the, uh, the Atlantic in 1960, that by John Allegro. He, wrote, uh, he was one of the first students of the scrolls, and he lost his job at Oxford because in 1960 he wrote an article pointing out that everybody hated the scrolls. The Jews wanted nothing to do with them, the Christians wanted nothing to do with them. From 1950 to 1960, instead of getting all excited about them, the first discoveries being made in 1947, and that's another story. You'd be surprised how the church, how the church is involved in this. It's, you'd be surprised how the church in, in the scrolls and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to stray around, but oh, I see the time is up now. But in 1964, I was sent back there and uh, I did an awful lot of snooping and so forth by the church, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was touch and go. There was nobody there. You see, it, it come around or anything. It was during. They were having a big fight and they were going on all the time. And it was it was really a, a risky business. But there were some remarkable things about the scrolls. For example, the scrolls were discovered by a shepherd boy called Muhammad Dib, who was up looking for sheep. Muhammad Wolf, see, and he threw a sheep went into a cave and he threw a rock after it and it went a clink and he heard the clink and went in and discovered the scrolls. As he tells us here, he gives an account of that story here. Well, uh, I stayed a, a week with uh, at the American University in Beirut, and it was all trouble there, and the shooting in the streets and everything. The airport was closed, everything like that, uh, and. Uh, 
I stayed at the house there, and it was a very profitable time. But I spent a lot of time talking with his butler, the man who was in charge, the major domo and so forth. He was very much worried. And uh, he was very much interested in the gospel. He, he especially went for the Pearl of Great Price. But the interesting thing is that he was the uncle of that Muhammad Dib that discovered the scrolls. And I see these things all tie up, and then I get into another situation and so forth, and strange things happen. But we're going to talk about the doctrinal teachings of the scroll and why they didn't like them. Uh, a few years ago, six or seven years ago, uh, the foremost Catholic scholar of the schools, Father Joseph Fitzmaier, he taught here in summer school. He gave a course in Aramaic, and of course there were only three or four people in it. And uh, he was the Catholic authority on the scrolls, and uh, Father Duvaux and Father Millick was the one who was editing, say, the Enoch scroll and so forth. And, uh, well, he said that uh, not... 5% of the scrolls at that time, just a, couple, a few years ago, had ever been translated, had ever been published. They just want to leave them alone. They say, the trouble is, you see, that uh, the Jews say it's much too Christian, this is what's going on. And the Christians say, well, now wait, this robs us of our originality, with the Jews having their sacraments and their 12 apostles and things like that before the time of Christ. What's going on here? They don't want them either, you see. So neither the Jews nor the Christians want them, so by a sort of a pact of mu a mutual consent, they soft pedal them, and uh, they don't like to talk about. And Norman Gold had the nerve. You notice it wasn't published in a Jewish publication or anything like that. In fact, uh, Solomon Sightline, uh, the editor of the Jewish Quarterly Review, they ran a long article of mine in two issues. Uh, he is the grand old man of Hebrew, and he always thought. The Dead Sea Scrolls are nothing but a medieval forgery. They're a fake. Somebody faked them in the 14th or 15th century, he said. And he, he wouldn't be shaken from that with all the evidence in the world. I remember talking to, uh, to Professor Albright that, that back in, uh, in Johns Hopkins, and he was, he was well, uh, Joseph Saad said, uh, Professor Albright di really discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. He recognized what they were. And I said, what about the, the carbon dating, all the rest? Won't they recognize? He says, they will not recognize them. They do not want to recognize them. They'll fight to the last ditch before they'll recognize them. Same thing with Solomon, the sightline, the same with Solomon Schechter, the, the Cambridge Jewish scholar. They said they had to be a fake because they didn't want to believe this. But the trouble is, you see, what you find here is not standard normative Judaism, but Book of Mormon Judaism, and that's the trouble, you see. These are the doctrines you read about. This is the kind of Jewish teaching kind of Book of Mormon. Well, we'll mention this the next time, uh, and then, gee, I wish we could go faster and slower at the same time.